So uh, recent Pew polls uh, tell us that over 20% of the U.S. population and over 70% of the 19 to 20-year-old 20, uh, 20 crowd self-describe as being spiritual but not religious, and that's a lot. It's pretty significant, and it certainly perks the interest of scholars of religion. It should also be of interest to this gathering for to reach especially the youth we may well have to become familiar with at least the general contours of the SBNR movement. And yesterday I was talking with Menachem, um, where is he? Okay. <laughs> Who was basically saying that one of the reasons that, that he and Phil ginned up this whole conference in this movement was because they wanted to reach a lot of kids who, who they couldn't reach. And, and many of these kids may, in fact, be of this persuasion or at least uh, are interested in it. So it has some relevance to what we're doing. Okay, so what does being spiritual but not religious mean? As my colleague Jeff Kripal has pointed out to me, it's on dating sites, so it has to be something. In fact, his daughter uh, was... Uh, yeah, it's a fun But it's on dating sites, so... Yeah. Oh, that, that's your daughter, not you. That's good. <laughs> Uh, but is it clear-cut and easy to identify, or is it more like what Gertrude Stein once said about Oakland, California? <laughs> Namely, there is no there there. And I have been to Oakland, and there is no there there. So it's a good question. My paper uh, that is on the website for this conference deals with one small part of this problem. I can also say that my paper forms a kind of, of introduction to that paper, which will be delivered tomorrow by, 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 by Rachel. And so we can all look forward to that. They're almost like cousins, actually. They fit very well together. The what? The Jewish cousin. Yes, the Jewish cousin. Yeah, the Jewish cousin. This is more general. So uh, for those of you who read my paper on the website, thank you, like Don. Uh, I, I will not assume that all have. And so assuming I can say that the paper that is on the website is best framed as part of a much larger project, a book that I'm editing entitled Being Spiritual But Not Religious, Past, Present, Futures. Yes, past, past. It took me five minutes to come up with that title. The larger project first asks the what question. What is being SBNR? So let's start with the easy. We can say what it's not. What it does not refer to are those who have definitively settled in a particular institutionally based religious tradition, are happy with its ethical and metaphysical postulates, and are consistent in observing its services and rituals. If this is the case, then it would suggest that being spiritual but not religious refers to those who are not wedded to a particular tradition, those who on the one hand are disillusioned with traditional institutional religion and on the other feel that those same traditions contain deep wisdom about the human condition. So to say I'm spiritual but not religious would then indicate that a person seeks to integrate religious wisdom without fully committing to what is perceived to be the false trappings and mendacity of religious accoutrements of all kinds, dogma, theologies, ideologies, hierarchies, etc. At the same time, befitting spiritual shoppers, it also speaks to those who canvass multiple religious traditions, mining their spiritual wisdom and introspective te techniques, not for dry dogma, but for the juice of peak experience in order to foster a spiritual journey tailored to their individual needs. Now, this general frame, the one that I just gave you, has been detailed a bit more in the contemporary academic literature on the topic. In being suspicious of organized religion, the typical spiritual but not religious person contests any claim to absolute authority and point with regard to traditional institutional forms of religion, their complicity in sustaining structural gender inequalities, structural racism, and roles in perpetuating unfair forms of economic, social, and political power. In contrast, those who profess to being spiritual but not religious tend to valorize individualism, free creative choice, expression, egalitarianism, progressivism, a psychological therapeutic approach to spiritual growth, and a seeker, quester, consumer mentality. They come from diverse educational, ethic, and racial backgrounds. They lean to the left politically and befitting a pluralistic culture or eclectic in relation to socially regnant religious traditions. They see humans as basically good and reject notions of original sin, or more liable to devalue a traditional community in favor of participating in multiple diverse yet related institutional forms, or on the whole pantheistic, monistic in outlook, affirm a liberative if undefined ethic, and are likely to affirm reincarnation. That's kind of a laundry list of stuff that I'm called together from the extant scholarship. 
Often this rendering of what constitutes being spirits but not religious has given rise to caricatures of who and what they are. So it is that a recent article by my colleague Linda Mercandante points to the dissolution character played by Laura Dern in the HBO series Enlightened, which some of you may have seen. A character who spends 50,000 bucks on a Hawaii New Age retreat where she meditates, practices yoga, undergoes therapy, achieves a level of enlightenment, then returns to her corporate job in an effort to change her friends, family, and the world as an illustration of what we might mean by being spiritual but not religious. Alternately, fans of Mad Men might recall the final series episode where Don Draper, on retreat at that famous California institute known as Esalen, comes up with a new advertising jingle, I'd like to buy the world a Coke. A jingle that in real life was recorded by a group known as the New Seekers. The underlying meaning of the lyrics being to bring love and harmony to all the inhabitants of the earth. Or to go even further, uh, if you get nothing else from my talk, do this. Go to Google and put in the church of being spiritual but not religious. It is three minutes of hilarity. I mean, I, I don't know if I've ever laughed that hard. It is extremely funny. Okay, but now that I've said all this, I have to resort to the time-honored scholarly dance, the qualification. The examples I just gave link the spiritual but not religious movement to neoliberal capitalism and its consumer culture. But some remind us that being spiritual but not religious has taken many forms, reaching back well over a century, and that the broad spectrum of types that can be targeted as being spiritual but not religious range from the creative self-expression, rugged individualism, and social activism of early New England transcendentalists like Emerson Thoreau and Walt Whitman to those who wish to, well, play golf with Oprah and Deepak. Not that there's anything wrong with playing golf with Oprah and Deepak. And again, ethnographic studies reveal that those who profess to being spiritual but not religious have a spectrum of allegiance to organized institutional religion, ranging from those completely divorced from religion to those who have a certain degree of commitment to them, even to the extent of making a traditional religion their major home, but integrating multiple other religious practices and ideation, as well as alternate religious and spiritual spaces to fit their needs for spiritual individuation. In other words, being spiritual but not religious sometimes shades into being spiritual and religious which exists that we need even more ethnographic studies as well as more analyses of what constitutes being spiritual but not religious. Analyses which, by the way, would include the way that scholars like me, in cahoots with pollsters, tend to invent and sustain terms like being spiritual but not religious, only to replace them later with new iterations as we see fit. In other words, whatever one might initially think being spiritual but not religious is, I can tell you that you are partially right. And also partially, as Humphrey Bogart once said in Casablanca, misinformed. And so being misinformed, we can say more. One of the ways to go about getting to know a bit more about what being spiritual but not religious means is to leave the press and go back into history. This would be the past part. When is stored and how it developed? Here genealogies are our friend. The historical drift, and I'm not going to go through all the nuances of it, is from a form of spirituality to find relative to church and tradition. Let's call this classic spirituality to a form divorced from church and tradition, let's call this modern spirituality. For example, in the letters of St. Paul, we find him speaking of spiritus, a term he used to signify those individuals whose mind, will, and heart were ordered and led by the spirit over against those egotistically attached and led to, uh, to, to the things of the world. But while through the centuries, spirituality carried alternate meanings, at one point actually being used in a juridical sense to denote ecclesiastical offices and property, Today, the church sense of spirituality refers to the aims and goals, practices, and virtues of believers defined relative to the totality of a church religious matrix. Think St. Teresa of Avila or St. John of the Cross or the Paulist Press series, The Classics of Spirituality. But modern spirituality, as my colleague Leek Schmidt has so definitively demonstrated, took a slightly different course. It was those pesky liberal religious traditions, transcendentalists, Unitarians, Quakers, their values, individuality, solitude, inner silence and meditation, ethical reforms, creative self-expression, and their consummate figures, people like Emerson, Whitman, Thoreau, Howard Thurman, Rufus Jones, Margaret Fuller, who produced through a variety of cultural mechanisms a specifically American version of spirituality. Walt Whitman speaks to this shift when he observed that the spirituality of religion would issue forth, issue forth only in the perfect uncontamination and solitariness of individuality an utterance that signaled the move to an unchurched, non-traditional, even anti-institutional orientation towards the divine. Going forward in time, one of the very first references to actually spiritual but not religious was in 1926 in a journal called The American Mercury, of all things, 
where the then president of the Rotary Club, again, of all things, described his organization, his organization as inclusive, non-sectarian, and notably as spiritual but not religious. That was married in 1934, and again, of all places, the Washington Post, in an article about the great Lusitania shipwreck, an article that described various models for memorializing the lives lost as, quote, spiritual but not religious. And while snippets like these can be found littered in magazines and journals, it was the fourth of a therapeutic system, that of Bob Wilson and his 12-step AA program, which he and others described repeatedly in the 50s through the 1970s as being spiritual but not religious. That was really the major force behind the popular dissemination of the term. And so that it would get Ellen Burstyn's character in the 1980 movie Resurrection, a character who has a near-death near experience and subsequently gains paranormal powers, being described as spiritual but not religious. And in 1985, Norman Lear, of all people, describing himself as, quote, a spiritual but not religious Jew. And again, in the 1989 LA Times Personals ad, a woman describing herself as, quote, a lovely Eurasian woman, spiritual but not religious, believes love is the highest expression of the human experience. When in 1990, the moniker spiritual but not religious was taken up by the Gallup poll, being, becoming one of three options for describing one's beliefs, religious, spiritual but not religious, or neither, with 30% choosing spiritual but not religious, the die was cast, spiritual but not religious was here to stay, which is to say perhaps the entire concept of spiritual but not religious really was invented by pollsters and, and scholars in cahoots, or at least partly. So there are clearly other forces besides the, gene the brief genealogy I just gave you. What we're looking for are those cultural forces that might cause not just a few individuals, but whole groups of them to become suspicious of and to withdraw from the traditional ways in which institutional religion asks us to demonstrate our commitment to the divine. Now that is an impossible task, to isolate all those cultural strands and see how they engage in kind of an elective affinity and, and morph together to create the uh, hegemony of spiritual but not religious. Uh, there is some literature on that. Uh, some have pointed to the role of neoliberal capitalism, which I mentioned, of democracy, of pluralism, of Eastern religions, Western religious past, uh, Protestant thought, Quakerism, uh, transcendentalism, new thought, etc. The, the decade of the 60s, the role of queer and racially marginalized communities, the American stress on individualism and pragmatism, the rise of a secularized consciousness and the separation of church and state. Uh, but this is really where the paper that I put on the website comes in. Took me a while to get to it. But that is where it comes in. And uh, what I do is I speak to the role of one such cultural strand that of the therapeutic social space. And confining it even more, I speak to the role of two traditions, the psychoanalytic and the Jungian. And what I really mean by social space is just think of a house. So you go in and there's the foyer and you can put your shoes there and you can put your bicycle there. It's not dirty. To spin Mary Douglas a bit, it's only dirty if you put it on the kitchen table. Uh, and you do things in, in the kitchen that you don't do in the living room uh, or the bathroom or the bedroom, usually. Little Johnny can have his ice cream in the living room, but if he spills it, then no, he has to go back to the kitchen. But all of those rooms are defined with respect to a social space. So the university social space is defined somewhat romantically as, as pluralistic and inclusive and critical. That would be different from a specifically theological space or a clinical space. And so the question is, what is a clinical space like? And what I do is I theorize that. And so what I do basically is I call attention to the fact that these these spaces are uh, somewhat like Victor Turner's liminal space. That the double doors of the psychoanalytic or Jungian therapy session, they're in traditional sense, they're double doors. You open one, then you open the other, close them. And when you get in there, you're authorized basically to let the cultural superego, which those doors represent, leave it behind and de-repress it. Don't be repressed, let it out. And those double doors, the cultural superego always has a religious quality to it. Uh, you don't have to necessarily be religious, but if you go Durkheim, basically your cultural superego has some elements of religiosity in it, even if not specifically religious. And so what happens in that liminal space is that the cultural ego can be challenged, and is. This is the recurring, famous recurring hermeneutic suspicion. And so you can think of that space. There's a lot of ways of thinking about that space. One is social control, but the way I'm framing it here is it's potentially a revolutionary one. So that, that notions of, of alternate sexualities or how to conceive of gender or racial intolerance, uh, they, they all come out there and then they, they come out into public and they get entangled with other kinds of social spaces, social media, film, literature. And they become 
common to whole groups of people to the extent that what William Auden once said poetically about Freud, that he is no longer a man now, but a whole climate of opinion under whom we live our varying lives. I think that's, that's more or less a direct quote from his ode to Sigmund Freud. That, that's, that's pretty well true. It's like a cultural soup. And so words like peak experience or individuation, uh, they're part of our common nomenclature. We might not know where they came from, but they're used, particularly by our children and our college kids, to think about what their spiritual life is, is all about. So these people are culture makers, people like Jung and, and Freud. And so what I do in the paper is to theorize that. And what I say is that the Freudian tradition, although it's not as clear now, but in, 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 in the beginning, really, really looked at um, the ways in which uh, class and gender and uh, sexuality and power gets projected onto religious narratives. So it's really not about the divine, it's about us. And it deconstructed that. And so people began to see it and said, well, wait a minute, that's not, it has nothing to do with the divine, that has to do with a bunch of people who just you know, want to control us. So not going to go to, the, to that church or that temple or that mosque because it's, it's not really religious. And, and, and most of the psychoanalytic understanding of religion is like that, it's deconstructed. The Jungian tradition, on the other hand, is a little bit different. They're like, well, everything comes from inside. All those myths and symbols and uh, all those things, th those are archetypical expressions. And then they're narrated and they're uh, captured by various kinds of social institutions. And then, uh, but they're really about, about the archetypes. So you can actually have a kind of unchurched spiritual experiences within a Jungian therapeutic setting. Uh, it authorizes those. So in combination, in various, various ways, I think it's very complicated, they've given rise to this, this deconstructive move on the one hand, but also this, this progressive um, positive move, even though it's, it's non-traditional on the other. And um, uh, the extant literature seems to show that this is the case. This is, this is true. Uh, Mercandante, going back to Mercandante, uh, she did a lot of uh, quantitative and qualitative sociological research and she surveyed her respondents, and she notes that, that they look inwards to their self for their source of authority. They proclaim that human nature is good, if not divine. They use psychological explanations for behavior, uh, seeking self-fulfillment. They use terms like individuation, self-realization, and peak experiences all the time. Um, they don't like notions of a gendered god, like a father god, um, which recalls Freud. And uh, they think of traditional forms of religion as being possibly regressive and childish. That's, that's Freud again. And uh, ultimately, they, they, they seek uh, some kind of, of communion with the deep inner self. And this is sort of, in a general sense, from the Jungian tradition. So explicitly citing Phil Reeves' classic work, Triumph of the Therapeutic, Mercandente notes that one reason for what she thinks is for the, these responses is that we live in the midst of the triumph of the therapeutic or so. Phil Reeves says, and she, um, she believes it. OK, so that seems to be this sort of like the past, also coming back to the present. And then there's the final part, which is um, if that's where we are now, and I, I will conclude with this, won't be long, uh, what about the future? Uh, what will the spiritual but not religious uh, movement uh, do in the future? Will it continue to flourish? Will it die on the vine, like so many other religious quote unquote movements? If it continues to grow, what will it look like? And that's where I think the scholar can put on another cap, that of the public intellectual. If the spiritual but not religious movement is somewhat nebulous, can we step in and help form it? Um, for one thing, uh, we're, we've definitely said a lot about what's wrong with it. Uh, that's in the books. Uh, again, summarizing literature, studies have brought up all kinds of concerns, issues, and debates. Among these are charges that have fostered spiritual narcissism, the lack of community, and, and Rachel's going to talk about this tomorrow, an insipid perennialism, a superficial consumerism, an unarticulated ethic and metaphysic, a disjointed connection to the past, a problematic emphasis on direct unmediated experience, an idiosyncratic eclecticism, and a seeming ignorance of the need for social activism. Questions abound concerning its viability, sustainability, and future relation to organized religion. So it's rather vast. So in going back to my paper, again, I target just one aspect of that, which is spiritual narcissism, and I engage the book by Jeremy Carrot and Richard King in their book, Selling Spirituality, which I'm sure a lot of you have read. 
And I don't disavow the merits of their argument. I know Jerry pers uh, Jeremy personally quite well. But I do claim it's one-sided. And it, it's not uh, actually based in empirical data, which they apparently don't know of. Um, but I found it, and it's out there. So I don't know if they ignored it or I haven't talked to Jeremy. It's probably not nice of me to, to say that about him uh, without him being able to defend himself here. But, but they don't cite it. And if you, if you find it, what you find is that, that there have been some empirical studies of people who have been through, through specifically humanistic forms of, of therapeutic intervention. I'm talking Maslow and his tradition. And the reason that's important is because is that is Carrot's big problem. It's really with Maslow. And he thinks that Maslow has been co-opted by sort of a neoliberal establishment to foist a kind of never-ending capitalistic growth of the self complete with peak experiences. And that, and that that's problematic and it's led to kind of a, a real kind of spiritual narcissism. But the studies actually show that people who've been through successful humanistic therapy are more uh, um, engaged in spiritual activism more liable to engage in spiritual activism. It's just the opposite. So finally, I suggest that Carrot's argument would have been better off if he had followed Christopher Lash's lead and used Heinz Kohut, in which case he would have, could have distinguished between a therapeutically transformed narcissism, and, and Kohut and Maslow were pretty, pretty uh, similar, and those challenged by primitive archaic narcissistic structures. This is sort of the grandiosity stuff. In other words, it's Kohut who gives us the psycho psychological models necessary for distinguishing the complex psycho-spiritual spectrum of those who profess being spiritual, not religious, because I, I think it's complicated. So on it goes. Uh, whether the spiritual but not religious movement, perhaps it's more like a train without tracks that will go where the cultural soil leads. Maybe the soil is the track if I might turn into Phil Wexler and become a sociology of knowledge guy, which we'll only see in the future retrospectively. In any case, it sure, likes, sure looks like the spiritual but not religious movement is here to stay. Thanks for listening.